learn the stereochemistry of an E2 um, reaction. By the way, let's take a look at your uh, handouts, uh, page one of your handouts. All right, so looking at uh, page one of the handout, let's look at the stereochemistry row. Uh, so notice that the stereochemistry for SN2 is inversion. Uh, hopefully you guys already know that. Yeah. The nucleophile has to come in from opposite the leaving group. Okay. Notice now we've now discovered, we've discussed E2 for stereochemistry as well. The cis and trans is determined by the anti-periplanar transition state. Notice that just like six little words, but it took us a long time to explain all that. So all those six little words stand for this whole big explanation over here. Um, you have to do a lot of work to actually use the anti-periplanar transition state to determine um, the E2. Um, then on the right-hand side, SN1 is racemization. Hopefully you're familiar with that as well. Um, since you're attacking a planar carbocation, you can attack from both directions, so you get both products. Um, E1 will produce a mixture, uh, both cis and trans. Um, so you have to produce, uh, you have to write it both ways for so E1. So if you were to write that, you would write, how would you change it? So if we were doing E1, you leave these two substituents the same. This was the case where the hydrogen was cis to the methyl, and there would be, an, uh, for E1, you would also get the case where the hydrogen is cis to the ethyl. So the E1 gives, so basically there's two possible products from any elimination. E2 gives you only one possible product. And which one do you get? We figure that out from the anti periplanar transition state. But E1 gives you both possible products. So you don't need to bother with the anti periplanar transition state for E1. You just go straight to the double bond, draw it one way, and then swap the atoms on one of the carbons, and then that will give you the other one. So you would, that, would be, um, that would come up if he said, did something like draw all possible products. That would be a clue that maybe there's more than one product, especially if he says draw all possible products, including stereoisomers or something like that. That's a clue that there's different arrangements. So in this case, we saw that for this E2 reaction, we only got the one product but the E1 would give us these two stereoisomers. So E2 gives you only one product, but E1 would give you a maximum of two products. Remember that there's some cases where there are no cis trans issues. If there aren't enough, if there aren't enough substituents, then there really aren't, if these were all hydrogen, say, then this would not be an issue. Um, but if, if there's enough substituents for there to be a different difference between cis and trans, then E1 would give you two products and E2 would only give you one product. So that's in the uh, handout. Uh, for that, I think that's covered in the second language book uh, as well. So both isomers we produced uh, over there. All right, so notice again, each little thing on that page one of the handout really packs, there's a lot behind uh, each of those. Uh, one other thing to mention before I forget, um, this is not the only way that you could do the stereochemistry for E2. You might see your TAs do it a different way. You could just rotate this picture to be anti periplanar You could just rotate this picture to be anti periplanar my experience, though, is that beginning students, it's much easier to rotate a Newman projection. Beginning students tend to make mistakes when they try to rotate this picture. Um, so you might see your instructor skip the Newman projections here. I'm confused about because I don't really, visually, I can't right. see when that, like, that hydrogen is coming towards me. Right. How I'm going to rotate that 180 degrees to get it like, right. completely opposite of the other one. Right. Yeah, there is a way to do that. Uh, if we had enough time, we could go through that and see how to do that. That would be I a like good skill. Thing. But that would be a good skill. But since our time is limited, it's best just to use the Newman projections. That's the best way for us to attack that. All right, so at this point, you should go back and reread that section of the second language book on the stereochemistry for E2 and E1, because they use the same exact method that I just drew here. It's just not explained in as much detail. So now that should make much more sense. And especially, there's a bunch of practice problems. What, that's what you need to really get this down. Uh, because you want to be able to get this right quickly and efficiently so you don't spend the whole test on it uh, if there's a question like this uh, on the test. I have a question mm -hmm. about the substrate because like in the second language book we had right. to fill in the these and I couldn't figure right. it out and I just didn't want to... Now you know there's an answer key in the back, right? Yeah, it doesn't have this though. Cause it, oh, it doesn't? Because elimination chapter they try to get you to like, use your book. But I think they still give the answers in the back. Let's double check that just in case. So I thought I looked at that. They did give it for some of them, but oh. I didn't think they gave it for this one. Like oh, yeah, 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 you're probably right. I might have said, look in the book. Where is that? Radioactive memo. Okay. Consult your textbook or class notes for 1 and 3. This is 10-2. So 10-2, um, they did give an answer. And they did give you these charts down here. That's, that's, that's for the, okay. Okay, good. I guess I was looking in the wrong spot. 
Yeah, so actually, the, the guy that wrote the second language book, his, his uh, what do they call it, his bark is worse than his bite in this yeah. chapter. He threatens that he's going to make you look everything up in, the, in, the, in your textbook, but actually most of the answers are in the answer key yeah. in the back. Yeah. I, I just, I, I guess I didn't see it. Okay, uh, I should remind you, um, for most problems in the exam, all that really matters is whether something is, you can put things into the excellent or good category or the bad category. Um, three categories is a little more subtle than most of the problems that you'll see on the exam. It's still good to have gone through that, though, because you might see a thought process problem like that on the test. That you could easily see a problem on the test that says, rank the following in order of nucleophilicity, or rank the following in order of basicity. That's pretty common in the homework problems. So um, that, it's good to have that. But if you're just doing predict the products, yeah. it's usually good enough just to ask, is this a bad nucleophile, or is it good or excellent? Good or excellent are, are pretty much equivalent for predicting the products. Yeah, because I was yeah. doing the problems as bad, and I don't think we had to... I think we had to rank right. the nucleophiles in, based on new, right. like, exactly what you said. And that's where those charts that he has in the second language book are helpful. But when you're actually doing the predictive products, yes. it's good enough just to have two categories. It either works or it doesn't. It's good enough. That's what I have in the handout. Okay, so um, well, let's pick another topic to, to spend our remaining time on.